You know, Unsane plays like a movie that was actually written by someone in a mental institution, in that at first there are moments where it seems to make perfect sense. You totally connect and you're like, that's brilliant, man. But then ultimately, after spending a lot of time together, you realize it's all been lies and you are indeed talking to a crazy person. Now, the film is not a total loss, and in large part, it is the clear talent on display that lures you in and makes you initially give the movie the benefit of the doubt. Uh, oh, and as for the whole shot on an iPhone stunt, you forget about it almost immediately because it's like watching any other indie, I mean, indie film. I mean, they use the iPhone like they would any camera. It's not like it's shot from the perspective of a phone or like suddenly someone's arm gets tired holding the phone up for so long and it starts to wobble or slowly drift downward. It's just they use the, an iPhone as a legit movie camera. Uh, so yes, you can shoot a movie, a commercial film no less, on an iPhone, but the only benefit is saving money. There's no creative benefit. I mean, I do think Soderbergh used like a filter or two, but you can do that in post anyway, and I don't think it costs really any more money either. So uh, it really is just a stunt. And a bad one at that because, again, you totally forget that it's shot on an iPhone. And they never even say that it's shot on an iPhone. So unless you know that going in, you'll just think it's another indie movie. So that's how I'm judging it. Okay, so let me first tell you my problems with the film, and then we can talk about the poor, talented people that Soderbergh talked into making this movie. And no spoilers, in case you do decide to watch this movie. Uh, it's not torture. Well, I don't know. It got really sad, and I think it went a little bit too far. We'll talk about that. But, you know, you can watch it. Let's just say that. And I don't think it would be a total waste of your time. All right. <laughs> Put that on the poster. Not a total waste of your time. All right, so anyway, problem one. This film can't decide if it's about uh, one of three things. Three things. All right, so the first is the dangers that women face in society. Here, stalking, right? Or is it a thriller about whether or not Claire Foy's character is insane or not insane? That thin line, right? That's how they sold it, actually. Um, and that kind of disappears pretty quickly in the movie. Or does it? It really annoyed me because the movie never, I, I think, didn't legitimately make up its mind. And then the third thing is, is they throw in this other uh, message about how mental institutions trick people into committing themselves for health insurance money. And on that note, the one good thing about Unsane is if you see it, afterwards you will forever read every contract or piece of paper you're asked to sign in detail. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I understand that some people like vague filmmaking, and some of you might right now be like, Grace, why does everything have to always be spelled out for you? But that's not the case here. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know about you. I appreciate a, a fine three-act structure, but, you know, I can appreciate vague filmmaking if it's done well. But here, you just can't do three, three messages at the same time in a movie and do them well. Uh, case in point, unsane. Uh, one problem is that the, the messages here contradict each other, right? For instance, again, is this a movie about how you should believe women when they say they're in danger? Or how crazy people can sometimes come across as sane? Those, those are in direct competition with each other. And also, there simply isn't enough time to do three messages in a single movie. And again, do them well. Um, then problem two. The movie is just too damn disturbing and sad, especially when there's no intellectual or creative payoff to make it worth going through all that. In fact, I had to look away from the screen several times, not because I was scared or terrified, but it was just too difficult to watch what was being done to a number of individuals. It was just, it was just, you're like, it's too much. It's too sad. Like, don't, don't, don't do it. Now, some of you, again, might be like, oh, but Grace, that's how things happen in real life. And, oh, those are my favorite types of movies. But again, if there's, it's, it becomes almost like torture porn because there's no intellectual or creative payoff to make it worth, you know, doing that. And on, on, that, on that note, by the way, if you don't have intellectual or creative payoff, then you're just kind of doing it for entertainment purposes. And I think that's horrible. I mean, I think women in particular will be disturbed by what's portrayed here and argue, again, that it shouldn't be served up for entertainment purposes, especially when the last shot of the film seems to almost be making fun of women. People laughed at my press screening at the last shot, and it was like, oh, bitches be crazy, yo, and you're like, well, you just negated a large part of what the film had going for it. It was weird. All right, so let's talk about the talented people in the movie. All right, so Claire Foy, 
very, very good here. And it's amazing that I would say that. That's just how good she is in the movie. Because she, to be fair, clearly has trouble holding on to her American accent throughout the film. That is something else that people were laughing at, particularly as they left the theater. They were like, was it just me? Or did Claire Foy's accent go in and out? And everybody was like, no, it wasn't just you. That thing was a roller coaster. She was trying. <laughs> okay. But she plays a very angry woman who sometimes does seem insane. And that she can make that woman still likable, sympathetic, and relatable, I think is really impressive. So she does a very nice job. You know what else struck me, though, while I was watching the movie, though? She is so similar to Emily Blunt in terms of looks, personality, and appeal that I don't see how they can both work in the same space. I just, I just don't see it happening. It's, she's like, unfortunately, the cheap version of Emily Blunt, right? And Emily Blunt sometimes come, comes across as the cheap version of Emily Blunt. She's still trying to get that career solid. So it's just, it's weird. I mean, I think, again, there can only be one. And I'll be curious to see which one that ends up being. But Emily Blunt has a heck of a head start. Also, uh, towards the end of the film, uh, Claire Foy is one half of an intense two-person scene that I have to tell you came across as really bad theater, like local theater. I was like, oh, this is tough to watch. And at first I was like, oh, is it, is it Claire Foy's fault? And then I was like, well, maybe it's the script's fault. But I decided that ultimately, well, it is partially the script's fault. The big problem here is the script. But it's also the other actor in the scene with her. I don't want to give away who it is, because again, I promise no spoilers. But that actor, if you look at the cast list, I bet you can pick out who I'm talking about. They are just not at the level of everybody else in the movie. And boy, does it show. I don't know why Steven Soderbergh cast this individual. It just really you know, boggles the mind. Because they not only brought nothing to the table, but they actually kind of hold everybody else back. And it's not nowhere is it more evident than this two-person scene. It was tough. To, that was where it was tough to sit through because it was just bad. <laughs> now, uh, everyone else, though, even the unknown actors playing the staff at the mental institution, if they're not a good actor, they're at least an interesting actor. You know, they have an interesting look. They bring a realness to the, to the, to the film. I appreciated that. But the other big standout besides Foy is 100%, 110%, Jay Farrow. I don't know about you, but I'm becoming quite the Jay Farrow fan. Now, of course, most of you will know him from his work on SNL, where he didn't get a lot of airtime, and he was, of course, known basically for doing really good impressions. But after Saturday Night Live, I think he's proving to be a very charismatic actor in his own right. He's not just an impressions guy. I mean, I only watched a few episodes of White Famous because it got a little too weird and a little too repetitive for me. Um, I, I do pay for Showtime. Yeah, I just stopped watching it. But anyway, he was excellent in the episodes that I did watch. I was like, this show's not great, Jamie Foxx, producer Jamie Foxx. And also, he had such a bizarre cameo on that show. I don't know if anybody else watched it, but I was like, this is not funny, Jamie. <laughs> Weird doesn't always mean funny. Um, but my big takeaway was Jay Farrow's talented individual. And I guess Steven Soderbergh feels the same way, because he cast him here, and he's able to do both comedic and dramatic quite well. I mean, Jay Farrow has a little momentum going, and I hope he's able to keep it going. He really, I think, deserves a career of his own. Now, there's also a fabulous cameo in this movie. I couldn't believe they kept it a secret. It's fabulous. I'm going to continue to keep it a secret. Don't ruin it down below. At least put a spoiler warning. Uh, but it gives the movie a real jolt of energy. And it also shows what a difference a genuine movie star makes. Plus, this person in their cameo tells Claire Foy uh, to read Gavin De Becker's The Gift of Fear. And there was like a wave of murmurs in the press screening because everybody know, knows what this book is. I know what this book is. But here's a, here's a side note. Well, well, first let me tell you what the book is if you don't know what it is. The Gift of Fear is by Gavin De Becker, and he was a famous Hollywood security guru. He had a security firm. He would help uh, protect stars and also handle, like, tell people, like, agencies and production companies how to handle firings, how to deal with people. He was like... He was like the most famous security person ever to come out of Hollywood, right? And he wrote this guide to how everyone can protect themselves in normal, everyday interactions. It's fabulous! But when they presented it in the movie, you couldn't tell, and this again is indicative of the problem with the movie overall, as to whether or not it was making fun of this book or if it was vouching for it. But while the movie couldn't decide, I'll vouch for it. It's a great book. You should really read Gavin De Becker's Gift of Fear, and I know some of you, some other ones of you have, because we've mentioned this before either on Twitter or other videos and some of you have been like I read that book too Grace it's fabulous great great book uh, so anyway well I have a lot of respect for Steven Soderbergh and most of his cast here I think this one's a misfire and I think it's important to remember that just because a script sounds smart in the room when it's being pitched 
it doesn't mean that it actually is a smart script, right? I think this is a real emperor has no clothes type situation. So that's my review of Unsane. Uh, there's, I think, I personally think there's no question as to the mental stability of this film. Um, and I would be interested to hear your thoughts about it down below. And put spoiler warnings again when necessary, because the twists and turns are like the only thing this movie has going for it. And I wonder if some of you thought it went too far and was too sad and a little bit insensitive. All right, so uh, uh, again, write your thoughts down below. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.